your grandkids. You ready? Let's open up to 2 Peter chapter, chap, I was going to say chapter 5, I'm like, there's no chapter 5. I'm creating chapters now. Chapter 1, as we work our way through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we only did four verses last week. We'll pick up the pace a little bit this week, but let's get a running start again. Started out in verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you and to the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given an exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours, and abound or increase, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old ways or old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, for this reason, I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in this present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again. We love, Lord, just to gather together as the body to encourage one another, to strengthen our walk, Lord, as we will see, to have encouragement through your word. And Father, that you would just speak to our hearts individually what you would have through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we started the book of 2 Peter again, and we were talking about the context of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Remember, 1 Peter was written because they're about to go through heavy persecution. He wanted to strengthen them. But then we got to 2 Peter where his passion started to come out, and the passion was that he knew that there were false prophets and teachers that were going to come into the church and deceive the church. And so that's the main focus that we will see when we get into chapters 2 and 3. But last week, we kind of focused on two things, which was in verse 3 and 4, which was that divine power and that divine nature. And that is where we're going to head today, and he will build, Peter will build on that for us. So let's look at verse, where am I? 5, there I am. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So what Peter is going to tell us is that the best defense against false teaching is true and right living. Again, being more like Christ. A church filled with growing Christians, vibrant in their faith, is less likely to fall prey to the apostate or the counterfeit Christianity. It is interesting, I've been, I mean, you see that we're having our anniversary, but I've been a pastor a while now, and I've seen so many winds of doctrine blow in and out of the church, 
And oftentimes the reason why people get caught up in that is because they simply are biblically illiterate to God's word. They just don't know their word. And so if they know it, Peter says, you're less likely then to fall into what will happen in chapters 2 and 3. But this Christian living must be based, again, we say this over and over here at Calvary, based on God's word. False teachers find it easy to seduce people who don't know their word but want more of an experience at church rather than being educated by God's word, to be taught and to come to a saving knowledge of Christ through his word. So, verse 3 and 4, again, as a reminder to get us going, shows that God has given us all that we need to live this life. Wasn't that good news last week that God gives us everything that we need so that when we get saved, that divine nature comes inside of us, and now we have all that we need to live this life. But it's always focused back to God's Word. So as we grow, as we will see, it is always through God's Word. Again, there must be a desire and a determination from believers to grow. You see, as we'll see in a minute, uh, where there is life, there must be growth. The new birth is not the end. Some people think, well, I got saved. Great, I'm not going to hell. How many of you said that? Don't lie, you're in church. <laughs> you're like, great, I'm not going to burn up. This is wonderful. And they think, well, that's it. But there is never any more growth in their life. And then they wonder why they go through the things that they go through. Why am I tossed by every wind of doctrine? Why am I not grounded? Well, because you haven't been growing. Again, the new birth is not the end. It is simply just the beginning. God gives his children all that they need to live godly lives. But his children must apply themselves and be diligent to use what God has given us. Spiritual growth is not automatic. Wouldn't that be nice if it was? I, I, often people say, well, I'm just going to let go and let God. Well, good, then you'll just stay where you are. We're going to see that we play a part in that. Peter is very clear in this section. And by the time that you're done today, you'll know that you're saved. Isn't that good to know? And if you're not, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to give you a Bible. We'd, let, we'd love to head you in that right direction. But spiritual growth is not automatic. It requires cooperation with God and the application, as we will see, of his word through this section that Peter talks about. Again, a Christian is supposed to glorify God because he has God's nature within us. And so notice what Peter says. He says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence add to or increase to your faith virtue and excuse me and virtue knowledge so i want to make things uh, real clear here today we're not talking about your effort to get to heaven on your own merit and be saved everybody got that and if you don't get that you got to hear this it is only by the blood of the lamb that we have any entrance into heaven amen okay got that so you're not working your way to heaven yes okay but there is a participation once you are saved in your life as a believer. You need to participate and you need to grow. And again, the way that we grow is by God's word. You have everything last week that you need to grow inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit. And so he says virtue. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. Let me uh, start with faith. Everybody has been given a measure of faith. So as a believer, you're saved, you have a measure of faith. And so what Peter says, I want you to add to that. So now this is part of what we are going to be doing, which is the next one, virtue. It means moral courage. In, in the day that Peter is writing this, they certainly needed moral courage because persecution was about to fall on the church. And they needed to stand up in the days in which they were living in, which there was corruption. And even back then, they were woke. Oh, I'm going to try to hold off today. Actually, I think I got through the first message without one thing about politics. 
We should have just ran that video. <laughs> so moral courage. Do you not think that we need moral courage today? We need to stand in the day that we live in, that we are being assaulted from every angle, be it from governments or other churches and the nonsense that they get themselves into. We need to stand up and say, you know what, as for me and my house, is that a choice? Certainly that's a choice. And we need to make a choice as a believer to have courage. Next one is knowledge, and again, knowledge on how to live in the day in which we are living by God's word. That's the wonderful thing about coming and going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Wasn't it wonderful to go through Revelation during the pandemic? Was that not the coolest thing? I didn't mean to do it that way. It was just in rotation to come up and teaching, or in 1 Peter, or wherever we are. It's wonderful to see how God works where we are teaching through the Bible. And it seems to just always apply to where we are as a nation and as a people and as a church. I love that. So as we grow, you need to remember you are a disciple. A disciple is someone who learns. Peter's going to say it's important to learn and to be reminded of these things, even though you've already heard them before. They need to be something that you hear over and over and over, because I don't know about you, but we get old and we forget. Parents, how many of you have forgotten your kids' names? You're like, don't lie to me, I know where you live. But we forget things all the time. And we forget promises in the Bible. And we forget that Jesus is coming soon. And we forget that this world is not our home. And we forget that this is just a tent, he'll tell us in a minute. Man, how much money do we spend on this tent? So we forget things and we need to be reminded of them. That's where that knowledge comes in. And so to knowledge, self-control, verse 6, and self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness. So verse 6, again, he says, so as we're building these attributes, he says the next one is self-control. Now, the Greeks use this word to specifically define self-control when it came to sexual desires. It was that, that was a specific word that they use. Now, Peter uses it, yes, in that context, but it applies to everything to have self-control. Uh, in, in 1 Peter, we were talking about the world that Peter lived in and the writing of that and how debased the Roman and Greek world was, and we kind of showed that we kind of live in the same world today as well. And as a believer, we have to have control. Again, we have that divine nature. We have the image of Christ. And so we have to be different than the world. I say that all the time, and I, it's not meant to be mean of any other church, but if you walk into a church and it's an infomercial Rather than being different? What is that saying to the world? Well, I came to that church and it was no different than a Tony Robbins message. Now I'm going to get sued by Tony Robbins. The church must be different. It must look different. It must talk different. And it must be, no, it must be, it, it, we need to have that self-control. Not only in the, the idea of sex and of marriage, but in all aspects, to have self-control. Listen, you, you might want to punch somebody. Maybe it's tourist season. If you're here, you're a tourist, we love you. Buy a t-shirt and get out. <laughs> it's May. Are you crazy for being here in May? Come in October, it's wonderful. What a beautiful month, October. And you, we wanted to, you want to throw something at the TV when they say something stupid. A believer, remember what you used to be like? We have to have self-control. That is your responsibility. We have, well, I just, you know, I was moved by the Spirit. But the, the Spirit wants us to have self-control. <laughs> You can't always blame it on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may, wanted me to beat up that guy. 
eh, that's not self-control. Notice the next one then is perseverance, our favorite Greek word, hupomone, because it's just fun to say, to build up under, right? Listen to this life that we're living in, the time that Peter was living. He says, you know, it's a hard life. You're about to go through persecution. You got to bear up under it. You got to, you got to make it through. And he's going to tell us that there is an interest, entrance for us for an everlasting kingdom. It, the good news is here. We just have to get kind of through these verses about our responsibility. But then he says godliness. And the idea is, and I don't want to overuse this phrase, but what would Jesus do, right? We use that phrase. We had bracelets. We have, but we overused it, but it really still stands. What would Jesus do in that situation? The godliness, having godliness, having a heart like Jesus serving and getting down and washing those disciples' feet. Even though I know it's Judas that I'm washing his feet. And then he says brotherly kindness or Philadelphia. So look, those in uh, Pennsylvania, you made it in the Bible. I said Jersey earlier and then I was rebuked. I thought there was going to be a situation. (laughs) You don't want to make anybody from Jersey mad. So brotherly kindness, and I I want to make this statement. Listen, you just got to be kind. Especially in the church, of course, to everybody we are to be kind. But brotherly kindness, guys, this is a family. How many times do we talk about this? This is a family. We're a family of believers. I'll tell you what drives me crazy is that people who are claiming to be believers bash other believers online. And unsafe people are reading that. What are they thinking? You guys can't even figure your own family out. Isn't that crazy? Listen, I don't know what your family was like, but everyone in this room has a crazy family. Everyone in the room has that crazy uncle, that crazy person, and if you don't know who that is, you're probably it. (laughs) And family does really often hurtful things, but at the end of the day, they're what? They're family. And we have to be forgivers. I'm not condoning their sin, but I'm forgiving them like Jesus. Because I don't want to live for the next 10, 20, 30 years with bitterness in my heart. Because it will destroy me and the enemy will use that bitterness. Amen? Just be kind. Be loving. I mean, do we not say that to our kids all the time? Be kind to stop hitting your brother. Be kind to them, even inside of the church. And then lastly, he says, agape, or love. Now, as a reminder, this is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion, as far as this word agape, it's not a feeling word, it's an action word. Uh, Would it be different if Jesus says, hey, I love you guys, I'm really sincere about that. But he never demonstrated it upon the cross. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, yes? So his action demonstrated how much he loved us. We... I mean, yes, I know you want to hear, I love you. Ladies, you want to hear it all the time. What do men say? Listen, I said it to you at the wedding. If something changes, (laughs) I'll let you know. (sighs) I'm in trouble later. And I know, but it. We get into this Hollywood love, this, this thing, and we bring it into the church, and we think that's what love is. That's not what love is. Love is an action word. This is what God did for us. He proved it upon uh, him hanging upon the cross for us. And love was exiting that tomb, conquering death on our behalf. Love is doing things 
and action, even when I don't want to do that, when I don't feel like doing that. Even when someone hurt me so deeply in my family or a coworker, I still love them. <laughs> it, wouldn't Christianity be different if we didn't have that commandment to love one another, to do good to those who spitefully treat us? And I think we'd have a lot more people. People don't like that. They don't like getting down and serving somebody. They don't like that image of Jesus washing the feet. And then he says in verse 8, so he brings that, that section of us and our responsibility, what we need to do. These are a choice that we make to follow Christ in that way. And he says, for if these things, verse 8, abound or increase in your life, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So for these things, what are these things? That was verse 5, 6, and 7. If these things are operating in your life, and let me just say this, it, it, don't look at that list and go, well, I've only got one. Great. Look, it, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? You read that, you're like, I'm nowhere near. Great. Is one operating in your life? Then we've got movement. The idea is that I'm choosing that I'm going to do this because I am, particip I am participating in my walk with Jesus Christ. Again, it doesn't save me that I am doing this list. We want to just check it off. Yep, I was kind today. Yep, I hoopamoneed today, and I'm good. No, no, this is something that we uh, uh, do ongoing, and that's what he says here, that this is increasing in our life. For if these things are yours... This is my responsibility. If these are yours and abound, you will by no, uh, neither be barren nor unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord and Savior. Because if, I, if I'm acting in these roles, if these are active in my life, then I want to grow even more and more in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. So I'm going to have that knowledge uh, more and more. In verse 9, he says, For he who hears the contrast then, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his own sin. So short-sightedness. Again, there are various degrees of impaired vision which are spoken uh, at, in the Bible as well as, he says, full-on blindness. Short-sightedness here specifies the form of blindness in which a man lives for this, ple uh, this present world rather than what is to come. They are occupied with material things to the neglect of the spiritual. Now, back then in Peter's day, they didn't have glasses, did they? So I want to apply this, and, and don't think I'm heretically teaching here, but uh, look, you get a little older. Anybody a little older in the room? And you start going, why can't I read font eight? <laughs> right? You're like, that font is too small. And then what do you do? You go to Walmart. You go to your favorite whatever. And you buy reading glasses, power one. <laughs> and you put them on for the first time. And it's like, wow, I can read again. There's letters there. That's what happened to me a few years ago. But then over time, what happens? You don't stay at power one. Wouldn't that be nice if that was the case? And then you're power one and a half, and you're holding on for dear life. I don't want to go to two. <laughs> and then you go to two, and then finally someone says, look, they don't make anything stronger. you got to go to the optometrist. And you get there, and he's like, here's your Coke bottles. So there are degrees, yes? So for our purposes, there are times where we can be a little short-sighted and we can be full-on blind to the things that are what's coming. We can focus more on this world, and we all do it, right? There's something that happens. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'll leave that there. Now everybody's in suspense. 
we can be short-sighted very often inside of the church. And personally, as we're looking at our life, as Peter is talking to us, he says, are we occupied with material things? He'll say in a second, are we occupied with this tent? Or is what is coming the most important thing in our life? And we are all guilty of that. There's no shame in this room. We, we have all been short-sighted. The, the thing is, I don't want you to be blind because that would be bad. And so, Lord, would you help me every week, every day to, to not be so focused on this world? Because this world is what? It is fading away. Peter's going to tell us, uh, coming up, I can't wait. It's going to mur- um, murk. No, it's going to melt with a fervent heat. That's real global warming. <laughs> but that's coming. But that's not now. But he says, perhaps, um, where did it, uh, sorry, 10, thank you. No, we're not at 10 yet, verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even blindness, and has forgotten, there I am, uh, that he was cleansed from his old sin. Perhaps sometimes the problem is we forget who we used to be. I said this, um, I think last week or the week before, that, you know, we get comfortable inside of the church oftentimes. Um, We're saved for a while, right? We... We stop cussing like we used to, which is a good thing. And then we're, then when we're out in public, someone does that and then we're shocked. I'm not shocked by what the world does. That doesn't offend me. I, I know that that's who I used to be. Weren't you like that as well? And we often forget where we came from and we lose sympathy and empathy. And then we don't want to be around the unsaved world like Jesus told us. A while back, there was a movement to create a Christian state in the United States of America. Does anybody remember that? First service had a little breakdown of remembering. They wanted to create a whole state that was just a Christian state. I would not want to live there. Have you ever seen a couple of churches try to get together and do anything? Like, are we having a potluck? What's your form of baptism? What's your this, that? I mean, I praise God that Billy Graham was able to do what he did, get churches together. And great glory, it it is literally supernatural that churches can come together by the disagreements they often have. But we want to live in a bubble. But that's not what God has called us to do. He told us to occupy till he comes, and he said to make disciples of all nations, all men. How can we do that if we isolate ourselves? And so, oftentimes, we forget how much God has cleansed us. And so Peter says, hey, we, we, we need to remember not to do that. He says, therefore, so now we're at verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so he says to be diligent to make your your call and your election sure. This shows how we can be sure that God has called us and that we are elect because we are doing the things before in those verses. Now, I, I often get this question from people. In fact, it's probably near the top is how do I know that I'm saved? And the fact that you're asking that, would show me that, because someone who is unsaved, they don't care about that at all. And so somebody who who generally is like, man, am I saved? Because they came from a works-based religion or a denomination. And remember, it, it it is the atonement of Jesus upon the cross. And by us accepting that free gift, admitting that we're a sinner, Lord, repenting, come into my life, great. And then what happens last week? You got a divine nature. You got everything that you need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. 
Now this week you grow in that by your part of the verses we just saw. And so what Peter says here is that you know that you're saved because these are operating in your life. An unbeliever could care less if he is kind or not. So, uh, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. When these are operating in our life, we know that our lives are becoming more like Jesus. It shows that we are being conformed into his image from Romans 8, 29. Now, let me just make this side note here. Is it is possible for an unsaved person to do moral things or even religious things. I mean, during a funeral, I often say, I'm not sure they like it very much, but I often say good people go to hell every day. You know that person, that you say it. Well, that, that guy's a good person. Well, no one's good. No, not one. And so some people can try to be, but Peter wrote, that these are matters of the heart. So their heart is different. Yesterday we had a men's uh, breakfast. Thank you men for coming out for that. It's wonderful each, each month that we do that. And we were talking about uh, the Pharisees, right, and how they were, they were mad at, the, at Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands the way that they thought they should wash their hands in their ceremonial way. And I'm pretty sure that those apostles didn't walk around with greasy hands all day, did they? They washed them, they cleansed them, but not in the way that those religious leaders thought. So the outward, everyone looked at the religious leaders like, man, they've got it going on. They, they're fine with God. But what did Jesus say? Inside are dead man's bones. So they had a form of godliness, but they denied the truth. So we can, too, there can be good people on the outside, but they're not operating with these verses. And when these verses are operating in our life, it's a good show. Now, just, just for a second, let's be prideful just for a second, and then we'll repent right after it. Isn't that exciting to know, like, you're doing that? You didn't want to, you know, run that guy off the road? Uh, he was, he, I, I had self-control, Lord. Thank you. That means I'm saved. Isn't that good to know? Or I did this in love and kindness, and I, 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 you know, I didn't really want to do it, but Lord, I know you called me to do it, and so I'm going to go cut that grass of that single mom in the South Carolina heat in July. I'm saved, yes, Lord. Do you see what Peter is saying? Why? Because massive persecution is coming on the church. And he knows when that happens, people are going to be questioning, am I really going to heaven? And he says, oh, yeah, because this is operating in your life. You're choosing to do this. Yes, you know that you are saved. Again, he says, to make your, uh, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure, sh uh, so if you do these things, you will never stumble. And the idea of never stumble is not that we don't mess up. That's eternal stumble or eternal damnation. That you're secure in Christ because these, again, are operating. If we are walking in the Spirit, then we will be spared from being disqualified for His service. And God guards the Christian and moves them forward, as we will see here in the next verse. He says, so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as, as these things are operating in my life, I know that I'm saved. He says, there's the entrance. You and I will be walking through it. Isn't that good news? And where are you walking? It tells us to an everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. He'll build on that in a second. Why is that important? Because this is not our home. He wants us to know that we're going somewhere. And if I'm going somewhere, then this is not my home. But I, I have to be careful that I'm not just building everything about this life. 
that I'm sending something ahead. And so he says, for this reason, verse 12, I will not neglect to remind you how much always of these things, though you know them and are established in this present truth. Again, Peter determined to keep on reminding the believers of the importance of the development of Christian character in their life. He wanted them to re be reminded of it over and over. This is your responsibility. Keep moving forward. Keep running your race for Christ. Even though it is tough right now, again, from 1 Peter, even though persecution is going to come, you got to keep running ahead. Even though we, he says that you're established in this present truth, he knows that there is a danger of being preoccupied by this world. I, I, I've said this over and over, long, uh, so many illustrations, but uh, I had a woman a long time ago said, uh, we were talking about the rapture of the church and uh, end times, and she says, I don't want Jesus to come. There are too much things for me to do and to see and I want to see my kids married and grandkids and all that uh, listen grandkids are neat thank you <laughs> but Jesus and eternity and as we'll see in a minute a new body way more I mean what's fun grandparents given the Grandkids, some cake and ice cream, and hand them off to the parents. I am so looking forward to that. Again, last week graduated two of them, very excited. None of them are having grandkids right now, which is good. Because none of them are what? Married. Thank you. You're doing well. But I look forward to that day, but not over Jesus. Not over a trumpet. I'll take that right now. I'd like to not do third service. <laughs> Gone. But we forget that. And we have to be reminded of that. That this is not my home. We have to have the proper perspective. He says, and I love Peter, by the way, I love Paul, but I love Peter because he's the guy that I think we all identify with. We put our foot in our mouth. We lop people's ears off. We say cool things, and then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> but he's a guy, as we saw last week, that had been touched by Jesus, and he started to use the word precious. A fisherman doesn't use the word precious. And he started to be changed. And I love Peter because he says this. He says, yes, I think it's right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. Peter had a proper perspective from his boss, Jesus, that this world was just temporary and the body that he was occupying was just a tent or a spacesuit. And he says... I need to keep reminding you of that. He says, knowing shortly that I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus showed me. What I love about Peter is that he went out with his boots on. There was no retirement plan for apostles or pastors. You go out with your boots on. My, my dream would be finish the message all right, maybe I'll drop in my office just to save you, but I would love that, to just preach and then go home to be with the Lord. You see, Peter knew that, and he says, listen, I know that this tent needs to be put off. But I, I, I say this as an encouragement to you. Be careful how much time and money you spend on your tent. Because... After all, it's just a tent. I mean, think about going to the Coleman place and getting a tent and then blinging it out. <laughs> Putting a Persian rug in there and air conditioning, although that does sound good. 
a little futon and a refrigerator and all that. And we think, but at the end of the day, it's just a tent. Now listen, if your tent rips, good, you should repair it. But how much money and time do we spend on our tent that's just a tent? We have a billion-dollar industry to make our tent look, smell good. And I'm thankful that everybody showered today. We, we're excited about that. But Peter had the proper perspective because he knew that he was about to enter into eternity. And he said, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Think about Peter. Uh, remember on that shore, we, we talked about this, how Jesus had breakfast for them. Remember, uh, Peter had quit, and he said, I'm going fishing. And he took everybody fishing with him, and they're out there all night, as they always do, because God has the best sense of humor. And in the morning, he says, hey, little children, have you caught anything? No, we've been out here. Put your net on the other side. Oh, okay. And then it's about to burst, and what does he say to John? It's the Lord he jumps in. Jesus already has breakfast there, right? They have that conversation. Do you love me more than these? And at the end of it, he tells Peter, when you grow old, they will take you where you do not want to go. And John tells us that that was signifying uh, what death he would go through. And don't you love Peter? He says, well, what about John? <laughs> don't worry about John. They'll boil him in oil, but it won't take. No, he said, you, Peter, deal with Peter. If I wish that he should remain till I come, what is that of you? Jesus told Peter how he was going to go. He knew that for, I don't know, 20, 30 years of his life. How would you like to know the method of your death? Jesus showed that to Paul as well, and Paul still chose Jesus. Peter still chose Jesus because he knew that this was just a vapor in a moment. So, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter charged probably Mark, obviously writing the book of Mark. That's Peter's gospel. And then First and Second Peter here, he charged these men to get these books into the hands of the church. And I just have to say this. I, I recently was rereading how we got the Bible. And by the way, that is fascinating. You know, the Bible was written on parchment and animal skins. And just so you know, those things don't last. If they're in the wrong environment, they decay. The fact that you have the Bible in your hand today is supernatural. How it survived and then how it even came into the King James in 1610. The fact that God knew also that the English language would be a dominant language. I'm thankful that we, by the way, you can't read the 1610 edition. We don't talk like that anymore. But I'm very thankful that God chose men and the copyists who were there writing, and you and I have that. Moreover, I am careful to ensure that you always have, let me just add this without being heretical, the Bible. Peter wanted that. He wanted the church to be established. He knew what was coming, and he wanted them to be sure that they were saved and that they knew that they were saved, and they knew that they knew that they were saved because of those verses that we read. They were operating in their life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word we thank you for your servant, Peter. And I pray, Lord, for anybody who, Lord, is just struggling with the fact that they are saved or not. That, Lord, that they would look over the list. Or in 1 Corinthians 13, to look at the love list and see if these are operating in our life. Thank you, Lord that we can know that we know that we know that we are following Jesus and that your Holy Spirit was given to us as a guarantee of salvation. So, Father, I pray for anybody's heart today that doesn't know you, that they're stirred today to know that this tent is about to be put off, that this life is just but for a moment and eternity is to come. 
And our choice for eternity is here and it is now. Today is the day of salvation. So, Lord, we thank you for our day. We thank you, Lord, for family and friends. And we ask, Lord, that you just be with us the rest of this day and that you would be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship this.